Welcome to my shop. Today we're going to explore some of the characteristics of an Allen Bradley 700 series pneumatic timing relay. This pneumatic unit was designed to be attached or as an add-on to an Allen Bradley 700 series relay. Now this is a NEMA rated relay and why do we have a timing unit in a relay. It's because this timing unit has no coil. All it has is the pneumatics as well as its timed contacts over here. We actually have this threaded rod out here and this is going to attach to or couple itself to the armature of this relay. Here we have an overhead view of the 700 series relay. You'll notice that the armature is partially exposed and that's for good reason. Now we need the coil of this relay for the pneumatics to function. When I energize the coil of this relay like so, you will notice that when the coil energized the armature was drawn down in a linear motion. It is that linear motion that we require in order to activate a timing device. Likewise, when I de-energize the power source. I cut power to the coil inside of the relay and as a result the armature will return to its at rest position. Now we're going to add the pneumatic components and we're going to mate it. But first I must withdraw this one screw so I can attach this threaded rod to the armature. So I will be right back. Bird on a tree. So I'm finished attaching the pneumatic unit to the relay body and you'll notice that this relay I've actually taken the liberty of cutting out specific portions on each side to allow our my viewers to see what's going on inside of this unit during the period of time when the coil of this relay becomes energized. What I find interesting about working with a pneumatic relay is that it doesn't really work on electricity so much as it works on a vacuum. During the period of time that the coil of this relay is energized, the armature will descend and that linear me or that mechanical motion is drawing a linkage inside of here and there is a little air chamber. The air chamber has an internal spring and when we release pressure that internal spring is pushing the air chamber and it creates a little vacuum inside of it. Now the surrounding air does not want to have a vacuum and so it will draw in a charge of air to try and equalize the pressure. Now the amount of air that is filling in is proportional to the graduations on this dial meaning that I can actually adjust the amount of air flowing into the bellows or the air chamber based on the position of this dial. I currently this particular model is set from 0.1 of a second all the way to 60 seconds and the air is controlled via an orifice and by adjusting it I'm adjusting how much the orifice is placed inside of a tube that governs the airflow. Here I have the pneumatic unit that's been completely detached from the body. What I want to bring to your attention is the air chamber that's inside of these bellows as well as what we call the actuator rod. Inside of this actuator rod is a small spring that maintains tension. When I compress the rod I'm actually expelling the charge of air that's inside of the bellows and we can actually see the bellows were compressed. Now when I release tension on the actuator rod the internal spring is now going to reset itself but when it's doing so 
it's releasing pressure and now what's happening is that it's creating a small vacuum inside of the air chamber. Nature does not like a vacuum and so we have a small inlet valve that's drawing in a charge of air to try and balance out the pressure between the air chamber and the ambient environment. And it is a mechanical linkage that is either pushing against or releasing the tension on that actuator rod that starts the timing sequence. Now, the amount of time it takes for the air chamber to balance itself out is regulated by the dial that is controlling what we call a needle valve that is traveling in and out of an orifice. If I restrict the amount of air going through the air orifice, I create more time. If I loosen this off and I withdraw the needle valve from the orifice, what's happening is it will allow more air to travel and as a result I'm going to have less time for the bellows to actually change state. So let's try that. So if I currently it's set for about five seconds. If I turn the dial and let's go for oh, one second. Now as I compress when I release this this should expand very very quickly and go. I'll do it again. I'm going to release tension. Look at how fast the bellows will expand. If I went back to that five second time interval, now I'm pushing down, I've expelled the air charge, I'm going to remove my finger, allowing for the actuator rod or the internal spring to expand the air chamber, creating that vacuum, but now it should take a lot longer. And there you go. So, Now that we've discussed the pneumatic unit, let's take a look at the body of the pneumatic unit and how it works in conjunction with this relay. So we've gone ahead and opened things up so that we can see internally what's going on inside of the well. Here we can see that these are the mechanical linkages that interact with the actuator rod of the, the pneumatic unit. When I turn on the power, and I just got to hold the relay, you will notice that the armature of the relay has, has traveled and is in the closed position. That the linkages internally have changed location. This is the mechanical linkage that is providing the pressure or releasing pressure on the actuator rod of the pneumatic unit. When I cut the power, we're going to see the armature travel back to its at rest position, and we're going to see that these two linkages are going to change state once again. And there you have it. Without turning on the power to the coil, I can manually activate the pneumatic function. Meaning, if I push down on the armature with my screwdriver, as I've done previously, what we're going to observe is that these mechanical linkages are going to move and shift. It's going to allow for the actuator rod to come down expanding the bellows. The bellows are taking in a charge of air because we have a vacuum. Now that audible click indicates that when the actuator rod expanded and the charge of air filled in, it pushed on a linkage. If I turn the relay around, what we would observe is that this set of timed contacts is going to change state. So as I push the armature a second time, I've initiated the timing sequence and what you'll see 
at the end is that audible click is that these two contacts have now changed state and the formerly normally open contacts have now closed allowing for a complete circuit to be uh, to flow through these contacts now that we've looked at the internal workings of the relay and its components I'm going to head over to the college and I'm going to set up a, a mock-up circuit so we can actually observe how the pneumatic relay can work between time delay on and time delay off. There's some real differences there that we need to understand. Here we have a circuit that has been mocked up to specifically demonstrate the capabilities of a time delay relay both in the time delay on and time delay off configuration. In this, I've set up a two, a two push button control station and each of these relays, the timed contacts, is going to control a pilot lamp so that we can visually see what is the status of the timed contacts for each of these respective relays. I've already got power. Let's initiate the circuit. What we're going to see is the time delay on relay, the coil is going to become energized. When the coil of a relay becomes energized, that's going to draw the armature in and the timed contacts are going to start a countdown. And based off of the position that I've set for the time delay, which in this case was five seconds, after five seconds has elapsed, after the coil has become energized, should we see this light come on. Conversely, in a time delay off situation, once the coil of this relay becomes energized, the timed contacts will change state immediately. And the time sequence will not begin until the coil of this device loses power and the armature will revert back to its shelf state. What we are working on is the linear travel of the armature of the respective relay that's creating us this mechanical motion that will either activate the timing sequence. So here goes. Activating the power to the circuit, we will see that both armatures for each of the time delay relays pulled in. For the time delay on relay, once that coil had energized, it began the time delay sequence and started counting down. After a five second time period had elapsed, the timed contacts changed state, allowing this light to energize. Over here, with the time delay off relay, we saw that the armature has pulled in and the timed contacts had changed state immediately and they're going to maintain this state up and until I deactivate the circuit. Once I deactivate the circuit, the coil is going to lose power. There will be no more magnetic flux. The armature will revert back to its shelf state and that will start the timing sequence for the timed contacts here. Once that time sequence has elapsed, will the light go off? There will be an audible click. So here goes. I hit stop, time delay on, contactor is dropped out, lights is stopped. Time delay off, coil, de-energized, it started the time delay after five seconds had elapsed, then the lights had turned off. The important thing to note is that the coil in this device was not energized when the time sequence began and when the timed contacts change state. The major difference in it, the coil of a time delay on relay will be energized when the time contacts change state versus a time delay off, the coil is de-energized when the time contacts change state. I hope you found this information helpful in your future work with timing relays and specifically with pneumatic timing relays. Until next time, please stay safe.